Coming off tonight is now and the gift that keeps on giving Sportsmax's coverage of the Commonwealth Games continues uh, through tonight into the early morning uh, through uh, to August 8th, the climactic day of uh, the Games. But between now and then, a lot of medals to be won and a lot of brilliant competition to analyze and dissect for you. My name is George Davis and I'm hanging out with uh, TNT's representative, Anil Roberts, and uh, the man from where are you from Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> good evening to you gentlemen good evening good evening and good evening to all of the caribbean live on sports max a lot of competition starting already i must big up my boy lance whitaker all 2 30 in the morning yes. up on tv yourself the sports max crew a lot to dissect excellent uh, Layton. yeah <laughs> Well, it's where I'm from, man. <laughs> <laughs> I am from everywhere. Really. Am, but, but it's been, you know, I agree, and it's been a very interesting year competition. And I think we highlight, we, we saw some highlights of some really great performances from Caribbean athletes today. And of course, we're going to talk about Flora Duffy, which for me, now she's gone up several levels yeah. because she's proven that consistency is the only way to go in elite sports. Absolutely. So, all right. So, the first gold medal of the Games went to a triathlete. That was Alex E. for England. He won the first gold medal of the Games. And then the first gold medal won by a Caribbean athlete in the triathlon as well. Another triathlete coming up trumps Dame Flora Duffy for Bermuda, breaking the duck for the collective Caribbean. The medal table looks like this. The Aussies out front, no surprise there. They've won 2,416 medals in Commonwealth Games history. Make that 2,432 with the 16 they have already. No surprise. The New Zealanders in second, England third, Canada fourth. The only surprise, based on historical medal performance at the Commonwealth Games, is that India is not in the top nine just yet. But it is going as per the size of the teams, and the Aussies have a whole battalion and a half at the Commonwealth Games. So no surprise that they're hoovering up the medals and will continue to do so over the course of the event. Dame Flora Duffy is a bit special. Nobody before had repeated as Commonwealth Triathlon Champion and after her latest exploit landing gold in the combination events, Donald Oliver, our ace producer, caught up with her. Flora, you've become the first athlete, man or woman, to successfully defend uh, the Commonwealth Games Triathlon title. How significant is this for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's really special to have been able to defend my title from 2018. Um, I knew that no one had done it and I had the opportunity to try and do that. So, yeah, to secure the win today was amazing and not, and also to win Bermuda's first gold medal of the Games. Um, I think we're one of the second events, so Bermuda's right there at the top of the list. I'm going to have to take a picture of that. So, yeah, it's really cool. You haven't had the best of your health-wise. You had two bouts of COVID this year. Uh, given that, did you have any doubts that you could actually defend the title? Yeah, yeah. Co I had COVID twice this year, um, which was really, really difficult for me. I had to be extremely patient with my body coming back from COVID and um, yeah, just trust that I would be ready in time if I was patient and built back slowly. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some pretty frustrating times this year, but super glad I could come here with great form and execute a race like I did today. You have now won everything, including the Olympic, World and Commonwealth titles. How do you stay motivated going forward now? Yeah, I, I mean, I have achieved everything that I've wanted to in my career. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to race for forever. And so this this is my last Commonwealth Games. Um, not retiring anytime soon, just uh, got to put that up. But um, yeah, I've decided that this will be my last games. I'll still continue to race, of course, but yeah, just to soak up this moment, enjoy it. Um, we have a mixed team relay that we're going to do on Sunday and to have a team from Bermuda is really exciting. And I think honestly, that really has inspired me and kept me going just to, yeah, share the course with, um, you know, two athletes that are younger than me and then Tyler Butterfield, he's older than myself. And honestly, he was the first Bermudian. He went to junior worlds and he was third and I saw that and I was like, wow, maybe I can do that too. And so it's a really nice full circle moment. Yeah, once again, Dame Duffy, the best of them all. And gentlemen, it is significant that the Caribbean's first medal at the Olympics in Tokyo last year was won by this lady, 
uh, Dame Flora Duffy, and she repeats the trick at the Commonwealth Games. Usually, when you leave an Olympics or a World Championships and come to the Commonwealth Games, you say to yourself, ah, the big hitters aren't here. It is my time to win a gold medal. But you run into problems when the World and Olympic champion is also the Commonwealth champion. You know there's only one place the gold medal will go. Well, definitely. And, and a, lot of, a lot of information in that, uh, that interview there. But what you're talking about, and people must understand what a triathlon is. You, it's not just three sports. It's torture. They put the swimming first. The swimming is the hardest. We aren't designed to swim. We're not fish. We are born to walk and run on land. When you get into the swimming, if you're not technically proficient, you get you utilize so much energy in that 1,500 meters or in the, in the Ironman where they go three kilometers that you won't be able to function. To come out of the water, get on a bike, start to ride. If some of you have ever ridden a bike in the gym for a long time for 45 minutes or an hour when you get off that bike you cannot even walk to the water cooler to get a drink because it's different muscles that you're using to put all of that together and to look so perfect so brilliant so well trained as dame flora duffy it's amazing later yes of course absolutely and one of the things that came out in that interview is the strength of character because two bouts of covid i just came through one and i know what that feels like your body feels like when you just come out of, of covid and the the patience but the will and the belief that you could actually get back to this level in time for the commonwealth games and still win speaks to the steel of her character and, and the the commitment that she puts to push to push her body to the limit and of course execute you can't you can't you can't characterize that any better than saying the woman is made of steel. Yeah, and, 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 and to, to, to uh, advance this made of steel point, Anil, she said during this Commonwealth Games experience that in deep stretch in the contest, the, the last event, when she was duking it out with Georgia Taylor Brown, the English woman mm -hmm. who came second, who also came second at the Olympics, she said that what gave her a spark in a, not a weak moment, because Flora Duffy doesn't have weak moments, but what gave her a spark in a low moment was the crowd. She said it was a distinct difference, the presence of a crowd in Birmingham mm -hmm. cheering you on and getting that adrenaline to flow rather than in the cavernous empty space that greeted them at the Tokyo Olympics. Well, definitely. And you remember yesterday you introduced that Birmingham has a wide uh, Caribbean population from the diaspora. So they would have been out there. They are well informed. And to see her and to see the Caribbean ahead, they would have been screaming where they were Trini, Jamaican, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, the, all the Caribbean would have been pulling for her, not just Bermudans. But what she also said there in that interview was, and we spoke about it, about Sports Max, about the importance of this show, Commonwealth Tonight, about, uh, you know, Lance Whitaker waking up 2 o'clock to sh give us introductions and show us all the Caribbean athletes, whether you're going for medals or not. It gives us a sight and a sense that we can belong, that we can be great. She talks about doing a relay with the person who won the bronze medal in the junior triathlon. She saw that and said, but wait a minute. I could do that and look what has happened. Probably one of the greatest triathletes of all time because she saw it, she felt it, she conceived it, and then she achieved it. Leighton uh, Anil made the point in his opening gambit that the triathlon is no ordinary event. The triathlete is no ordinary athlete. And when I was a, a, a boy watching the decathlon and looking at the experts of the great mm -hmm. Dana Bran, and I looked at, 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 at even Bruce Jenner, uh, different person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce yeah. Jenner is on the record books as having conquered the event. Yeah. And I said to myself, if God were to design the ultimate athlete, that athlete would be a uh, decathlete or a hip or a heptathlete. I can modify that now to say that if the master, the creator, whomever your creator is, were to design an ultimate athlete, it could also very well be a triathlete. Absolutely, because it's a it's a combination of strength, um, but not just strength, but strength endurance as well, because. Each discipline pushes you to your limit. The swimming, the riding, and then of course the running. All three, in individually, each of those disciplines pushes you to the limit. To combine all three in one event is remarkable that somebody can actually complete that and then still be standing at the end. It's absolutely mind-boggling that somebody is able to do that with such consistency as well. 
Yep, through the fire, to the limit, to the wall. Shaka Khan for a chance to be with you, for a chance to win a gold medal. Flora Duffy went there and beyond. We take a break when we come back here on Commonwealth tonight. We'll talk about netball. The script, well, the results went according to script. So none of the Caribbean teams would have been put out by what happened. It's just that the Jamaicans were the only ones to register a victory. We'll talk about what the Trinis did and the Bajans on the netball court as well. with us on the uh, Commonwealth Tonight Show, almost at the Sports Match Zone, but a little bit of cross-promotion doesn't help. Uh, so the three Caribbean teams, well, three Caribbean teams took to the court in the netball action earlier today, and the first team out was uh, the Trinidad and Tobago team, the Calypso Girls, uh, locking horns with the defending champions and hosts England, and then we saw the Barbados Gems, they battled uh, mighty Australia, and then the Jamaicans took the floor against a Welsh team that, based on pedigree, they are much better than, significantly stronger historically than the Welsh. And that's where we're going to start our recap. So this game, the Welsh, their best finish at the Commonwealth Games. They've been sixth. That's their best finish historically. The Jamaicans, of course, they won the bronze medal at the last go-around at the Commonwealth Games Gold Coast in Australia. Now, the Jamaicans have made uh, several changes. Anil Roberts has a very, very interesting theory about why the Jamaicans have been chasing two shadows, England and Australia, well, Australia and New Zealand for so many years in netball and only fleetingly are coming to grips with that shadow or though with those shadows. You can't grab a shadow. There you go. But he's ha he has a theory as to why that has happened and he'll expand by the time we come to the analysis. But first, let's look at how the, well, as we saw the Jamaicans go about their work, the Wales team no match for them in the end. I saw, I watched the sports magazine. I'm going to start with Leighton first. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I heard your comments measured, of course. Mm -hmm. I must tell you that I wasn't impressed with what I saw, but that's to be expected. It's the first game they were short on match practice, these mm -hmm. Sunshine Girls were. So you wouldn't have expected them to be hitting the high notes from their first game because in winning a championship, you build towards a championship. So it's no criticism to say that today wasn't impressive in parts, it was workmanlike. It was workmanlike, and understandably so, as you mentioned, George. The fact is that they didn't have much match practice coming in. Some of these players, a lot of them actually, were just coming off the Sun, the Suncor Super League yes. in, in Australia. And so there might have been a little bit of a down, of downtime, which took away some of that sharpness, because Johnny Lufolo and, of course, you know some of the defenders are had an intense season. So maybe a few weeks of relaxation took that edge away. And of course, you saw it early in, in the competition where there was some glaring, you know, turnovers that weren't necessary. And I think that came because they weren't as sharp as they needed to be. However, as the game progressed, you saw the sharpness beginning to come back. And of course, they dominated the Welsh team and, and, and won quite comfortably. But they're going to have to be a lot better against the top teams like the Australian and the New Zealand because we saw them today. Those girls were also playing the Subcourt Super League and they were still sharp coming in which is a very ominous sign for a team like Jamaica looking to topple either of them if they're going to win a medal at these competitions. Before you engage into the theory, which I'm keen to, uh, to, to, to bring out for the benefit of the, of the viewers, Anil, the permanence of class, largely why the Sunshine Girls are comfortably better than Wales today. Pure class. I mean, there's no competition. So really and truly, you get in their first game, you did what you had to do. The coach will, will sit down with them. They, the girls themselves are professional and they understand the mistakes. They understand that they didn't play at 100%. They also understand that without match practice at that level, you can't expect in a first game to be clicking. The Australians could. Their system uh, allows for that. But Jamaica really looked good. You feel proud to see 
the athleticism, the athleticism, the, the fitness, the, the teamwork, the strategy, the, the sort of flair that is coming out. So while it's not perfect, we're not looking for perfection. Absolutely. You want to build into it like a Italy 1982 World Cup. Look. Nobody saw them as anything. Nil nil with, with Poland one wall. And then you just saw Paolo Rossi come out and they defeated Brazil. in the second round Brazil and Argentina, then gave Poland four and beat the Germans. So that's how you build through a competition. So I was impressed, not ecstatic, but they did their job. All right. So we, we, we have to move it on, the producer says. We'll talk about that theory another time. Where of course, we have one whole tournament to so do. <laughs> uh, the Trinis, the Calypso girls, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, they were in action as well against England. And uh, the Calypso girls got their fingers burnt in that contest against an English side that, in, in real time, when you look at the final score, gentlemen, and the lopsided nature of it, you, you'd say, well, England were large and in charge. But they started sloppily, not partly because of their own doing. They treated the ball as a hot potato at times, the English girls. Mm. But I thought the, the Trinidad and Tobago team played good defend, defense in the first quarter. But then... Their intensity dropped, and perhaps it is that the English women started to assert, and then that's when the separation happened between the teams. But Trinidad and Tobago would not have marked a tick beside the English assignment. They probably would have put an X and have looked to easier opportunities in the pool to get their way. Well, you should be a diplomat, George. <laughs> you saw positivity in that in the first quarter defense. You call my ladies the Calypso girls. I think we might have to change the name. Because Calypso is dead in Trinidad and Tobago. There's no Calypso anymore for the last seven years. And our team plays flat-footed. With all due respect, we are world champions 1979. So to come there and just be embarrassed and you introduce this as it went to script, that is embarrassing for me. This is not a sport like Rugby Sevens or some bowls game. This is a sport where we had Jean Pear, Castanada. We had some of the greatest innovators. Jamaica learned from us and they are competing. I'm not impressed with any positivity. We got a blowout. It was a blowout, an embarrassing blowout. And I have to accept it. And we have to get to the drawing board and decide to fix it. From down below. Before Leighton comes in, great empires break like biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact is that you said it was embarrassing that I acknowledged it as going according to script, but you wouldn't deny that it's the truth. No, it's the truth. Okay. That's, Excellent. Why, that's, Excellent. Yes, Excellent. that's why it's embarrassing Excellent. because you did not lie. Excellent. That's sad. <laughs> you're, you're, you're taking what TNT One did against things England. That, and just to, to follow up on the point that Daniel made a while ago, Samantha Wallace is one of the best netball players in the world. For sure. Right? She's one, she, she, she leads the Swifts and she plays really well consistently year in year. Top so, five in the world, yeah, I'd say. There's no reason why Trinidad and Tobago is not able to put six other players on the court as good as she, she has been for Trinidad over the years. And that's a disappointment for me because I think Trinidad has the capability and I do believe that they have some of the resources necessary to get there. I think their resources are actually better than Jamaica's. The thing is that for some reason, Trinidad is not able to break that glass ceiling and break through and become a team that we know they're capable of. Um, so that was a disappointment for me today because I, th I do believe in my heart that Trinidad can be one of the best teams in the world, but somehow it just doesn't happen for them. All right, what about Barbados? They played Australia. Australia still smarting, you would think, uh, from being beaten in an arm wrestle with England in the last final game, the championship game of the Commonwealth Games. And the Gems Anil came up short. Well, all you have to do is change the colors and the description and the script is the same. Change from my beautiful red, black and white to the blue and gold of Barbados. It was, I'm very sorry, it was an embarrassment for countries who have played this game for decades at a high level. Um, the administration, the coaches, whoever put this effort together needs to sit down get to the drawing board and understand our girls look at them their spacing on the floor was not it looked like uh probably uh primary school uh, some of the passing the turnovers they made it so easy for the australians uh you know i don't expect them to beat the australians but don't hand it to them on a platter yeah, yeah. yeah. Aust australia's a well all machine but yeah. 18 points at one point it was 38 to 5 i was wondering what i was watching you know it we there is the potential there to be better and um for some reason barbados doesn't get it i don't know why i i, I wish i knew the inner workings of their program but uh, it doesn't seem that much is going on there 
<laughs> you see, George, let me just say, because people may say, boy, I nail your harsh. Yes. Because I believe that we are the best. We can be the best. If we go into a competition, it's not to just say we go on a plane to eat food. We go in there to compete. And if you can't prepare, the Commonwealth Games is not a secret. You know the level you're going to meet. You know what you're about. You can't go out there and, and get and 30, 35, what, 38, 5? I mean, each person gets the ball alternatively. And you can't tackle it. It's not like football where you could kick down a man and take the ball. For them to turn over the ball means you have to be doing something wrong. The way the game is designed, it's designed to be a close game, George. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but, but look, gentlemen, perspective here. And, and Anil says I'm the diplomat. That's my role. Yeah. Because the fact, the fact of the matter is that those two teams, Trinidad and, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, they drew acid tests for their first game. Uh, Wales played Jamaica, a team that we know is better than them, but they weren't disgraced. And I guess, viewers, what the gentlemen are saying is that they would have expected a better showing. Nobody on this set is saying that TNT ought to have beaten England mm -hmm. or that Barbados could have laid a glove on the Australians, but a better showing would have given them optimism about those two netball programs going in the right direction. But what I will say is that that was the first game and better assignments will come. Assignments will come that both teams believe they can win, especially when both play each other. Well, after right? this job here, you should be a pastor. You're very, <laughs> you have that spirit. You build it up. There but unfortunately, yes. sport is science. Uh, absolutely so. And, and uh, you speak of spirit. Let's leave Ray and Nevi out of this. Let's go to the break <laughs> and come back with more here. Commonwealth Tonight continues with more analysis about the exploits of our Caribbean folk at the Commonwealth Games taking place in Birmingham, England. Yeah, pots are on fire. Optimism is sky high because the man from TNT, Dylan Carter, is into the final of the 50 meters butterfly. And guess what? He is a strong medal prospect. Let's look at what he did in the semifinal and then hear from. 23.67 to the important time for Tom McLeod. What you on now? Yeah, John's going to take this in lane number seven. That's a surprise for you. Carter in second place. Leander Edwards and Barrett may have made it in fourth place. Adam Barrett may well have made it into the final, but Chad Leclerc may not. Let's have a quick check. We're waiting for the computer to revolve. And, well, we'll wait for it to definitely be determined, but... Dylan, you promised this morning that you would turn it up a little bit, and, and I think you did. You went faster in the semi-final. How would you assess that? Um, yeah, I went a little faster. Not as fast as I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, we got the job done. We're in the final tomorrow, and tomorrow we're going to fight for a medal. Uh, how do you assess that semi-final swim? Uh, you know, just, just didn't, feel, didn't feel as poppy as I was about a month ago. It's a tough time. It's a tough five-week period. So, uh, but I think I've got more in the tank, you know, I know I've got, got a little bit quicker, so hopefully tomorrow. Importantly, how do you now prepare over the next, what, 22 hours yeah. before that final? Yeah, I think the, the only thing I can do is rest, you know, get a lot of rest, get a good sleep and, uh, you know, try to be as fresh as possible for the, for the race tomorrow. DC swimming fast for TNT. He did 23.41. That's the third fastest time out of the semifinals heading into the final. Some way off his personal best though, Andy Roberts of 2193. Technically, talk to me about that swim by Dylan Carter. All right, first of all, brilliant swim. He did what he had to do. He got progressively faster. He looked comfortable in the heats, uh, 2359, and then went down to 2341. He's got a lane in the final. He's ranked third, so he'll be swimming out of lane three. He is a medal favorite. However, let's get down to the analysis and the interview there. I did not see that interview before. But now I understand that he understands what is going on because 
He's a brilliant, intelligent young man. When he said he wanted to be fast and he's not feeling as poppy, what happens as, as an athlete when you taper and you rest? You maintain your power. So you go in the gym, you do your work, you generate an anaerobic capacity. You try to hit it perfect, which he tried to do for the World Championships a few weeks ago. It's then incumbent upon the coach now to lift the work level, get the, the, the muscle fibers back up to 100% by doing maximum reps as little as possible. Possibly, if your top bench press is 300 pounds, you do like four reps, two sets, not to tear the fibers down too much, to maintain your anaerobic capacity and speed. What I saw in his race, both in the morning and the evening, he took 21 strokes. Now, he has the best start in the world. When he dives off underwater. So if he's not ahead at the 15 meter mark before he takes his first stroke at 14 and a half meters, we are in some problems. When he said he didn't feel as poppy, it's because he, when he has the power to generate uh, throughout to go 20, uh, 293, he takes 20 strokes. He took both in the heats and the semifinal. 21 strokes at a stroke rate of about 54 per minute 54 strokes per minute ideally for him to be powerful and to get down to that time 23 low 22 9 he needs to be 20 strokes and at a slower stroke rate of about 51 per minute so what that tells me is that his power output his anaerobic capacity has diminished a bit but where I hold it now, he is guaranteed a medal, okay? He must be on the podium. I think it's between him and Singapore Tiong for the silver. The man Ben Proud now worries me because he's looking strong. He looked controlled. He went 23-5 in the morning and then 23-0. He did not breathe. He, went con he got out in front and he didn't even accelerate through the last 15 minute meters. So Ben Proud of England is the odds on favorite. For Dylan Carter to get up and take that goal is going to have to dig deep within his mind. Sometimes the body is not ready, but a racer like Dylan Carter is what you call a big time. Turn on the lights, get mental, get ready to race. So if we're going to take that goal, he's going to have to get off the blocks in 0.5 seconds reaction time, 0.57 seconds. He's going to have to get to the front, take two more butterfly kicks under the water, shoot out, and hold on because Proud will be coming. It's going to be tough. I think the goal is hard, but once you've got a lane and with Dylan Carter, a man who's born to race, I wouldn't bet against him. All right, before you put the cork back in, and then let me ask you this. Between himself and Tiong, you say if the race goes according to form at this minute, then Proud is the gold medal favorite. Correct. And Tiong and Carter are fighting for silver. Based on the swims you've seen from both those men progressively, yes. who has the capacity for the improvement that will win that silver medal between Tiong and, and, and Carter? Physiologically, Tiong is better prepared at this time. Physiologically. But Dylan Carter has been there. He's done that. He's what you call a race day horse. So Tiong has not proven himself yet. So if you tell me mentally when the pressure's on, when the lights flash, when the introductions are big, when you're live and 20 million people are watching you, my money's on Dylan Carter to take Tiong because he's a he's born for the moment. There's some people who are practice players. You know when you're playing football, some guys, they shake you up, they roll, they're good in practice. You turn on the lights and you can't find them. Dylan Carter is a big like, big occasion guy. So mentally, I put it on Carter. Physiologically, if you're just going on pure readiness for speed, Young is a little bit better right now. If I can ask Le a quick of question, course, George. Yes, of course. When he said that he didn't feel as puppy, it, he looked a little worried. Yes. Is it something that he has to go and change his mindset tonight and say, okay, fine, right. it wasn't right today, but we can get Brilliant. it right tomorrow? Because he's bright, intelligent, he knows the power is not there. He knows when he drove through his face, he knows his body was a little low. He knows he took that extra stroke. So now as a coach, you can't pretend when you have an intelligent athlete, you can't lie to them. You have to sit with him and say, yes, my brother, you're not ready. We, we lost a little bit of speed. However, 
this is what we need to do in order to get the medal. We have to utilize your streamlining and your underwater kick to a supreme level. You have to be mentally focused because you are better than them. You are more experienced, you're a race man, and you've got to get on and hold Tiong and beat him and shake him up. Proud will be in the lead or you'll come and you've got to decide at that point, are you here for gold? Are you here to represent the red, white and black? And mentally, you've got to lift him up as a coach to get him ready. Hear you on that. All right. The Bahamian lady, uh, Lily Higgs, uh, fresh out of uh, University of North Carolina. That's Michael Jordan's old school. school. The Tar Heels. Uh, she had a swim in the 50 meters breaststroke. And uh, yeah, she was some way off her personal best, her record for this region. Uh, let's see how that one went. Again, starts are all four in these sprints. Pretty much an even break there. And let's see whether Imogen Clark can get a nose in front while she's having a, a good old race with uh, Tatiana Schoonmacher. Yeah, and Imogen Clark this morning had a very high stroke rate. And you can see here she's using that again and she's starting to put some distance between her and Schumacher, and Clark is going very well in that red hat big loop. Yeah, she looks like she's got this. This is really not the distance for Schumacher. She's much better over 200. That stroke doesn't look right on her on 50. And also, she's still second. Hanlon getting third place for Scotland, and fourth to... a little bit faster in the semi-final assess your day's work for me yeah um you know going into this morning it was just the first swim of the meet so trying to feel it out a little bit i would have liked to be faster tonight but i'm just thankful for the experience to swim in the semi-finals and get another swim in tonight so at the world championships earlier this summer you didn't make it to the semis of any of your events and you come here and you do that how proud are you of what you've achieved already here Oh, I'm so proud, you know, to be able to get the Bahamas up on the scoreboard tonight was um, something that was really made me really happy. And, you know, just showing everyone that our little island can have some fast swimmers, too. It's really cool. So and you still have a few more events to come. What are the hopes and expectations for those? Yeah, you know, hopefully as the meet goes on, you know, the swimming gets a little easier once you get in the rhythm of competition. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to race and excited to be here and get the whole experience. Being in the village is nice and seeing a few faces of people from other teams that you've seen at meets here and there in the past year. So it's just good to be here and experience the whole thing. So. Lily Higgs there from the Bahamas. Uh, gentlemen, she went into the semifinals with the, sec oh, the slowest time through mm -hmm. and uh, 33 one eight way of what she's capable of. Tailed off, well, to the untrained eye, Anil, tailed off from as uh, she entered the water and just wasn't able to claw back any ground. But she says she's happy that she got that one out of the way. Well, you've got to be happy. You've got to think positive. But what she spoke about was these, these swimmers all had world championships. So she's training with a U.S. coach. Now, sometimes when you're at a university coach, they don't understand the importance of your country being from a small island. They put all their focus on the university and the NCAA. So you're already peaking at, a, at about March, April for your conference meets and your NCAA championships. You maintain that for world championships. And then to come to the Commonwealth Games, you're on the long end. So breaststroke is one of the hardest strokes. People think it's butterfly. But the energy component for the speed that you generate in the water for breaststroke means that it's the most difficult stroke to get going. So when you lose your, your muscle strength, your anaerobic capacity in breaststroke, it's exacerbated. So you would see her, her time will be down. I mean, I, I, I regret that I don't have many regrets in, in life, but two of the regrets that I would have for the Caribbean is that Alia Atkinson never won that gold medal despite world records, despite uh, Commonwealth records. And also that George Bovell, I was not able in 2002 to convince him of the importance of going to the Commonwealth Games. He had gone to the World Championships in Fukuoka, Japan. He moved from number 44 down to number one in the world, finished fourth in the World Championship final. He was number one ranked Commonwealth record holder. And I said, son, let's go to the Commonwealth Games. But he was at your Auburn University and they, they teach you this American uh, university first and, and sort of dumb, dumb down your country. So I wasn't able to convince him at that time later on in life he understood the importance and i think i'm seeing the same thing here with higgs that the american system is great coaches are brilliant 
but they do not put the emphasis on our little islands. And as parents, you have to understand, you have to find a coach. You have Anthony Nesty now at Florida and so mm -hmm. on. You've got to find a coach who respects the gem that you are because we don't have many. And whatever we have, we have to take care with kid gloves. Before I let you, uh, I, I, I let you in on the conversation, let's hear this interview with Timothy Hodge, a para swimmer. Swimming the same time you did for third place at the World Championships, but it gets you Commonwealth gold. How special is that for you? Um, it's just incredibly special. Uh, I went into this meet with, with hopes of good performance and uh, to come away with a medal is icing on the cake. Talk to me a little bit about your story that has gotten you to this stage. Um, so I made my first team when I was uh, 14 back in 2015 um, with the hopes of being able to stand on the podium one day. Um, I was lucky enough in uh, 2018 to stand on the podium twice at the Commonwealth Games that year. Um, and I've, since then I've won medals at World Championships and Paralympics and um, uh, I finally was able to win a gold medal earlier at World Championships this year and won my second international gold medal here tonight. So I'm really happy. And for the first time ever, we have a fully integrated para program into the Commonwealth Games. As a para athlete, how does that make you feel? Um, it, it makes me feel proud, if anything. Having a, a fully integrated program means that so many people can watch both the Aberdeen and the Paralympics compete alongside each other and see them on, I guess, level pegging with the respect to the world stage and and the, the the gravity of these championships and I think it's it's a, a message to everyone else out there who wants to get into para swimming or para, para sport in general um, that this is something you can aspire to and you could potentially go well beyond this if you really put your mind to it but this is just a, a great inspiration to a lot of people out there who want to compete. Well, you're an inspiration to a lot of people out there. Congratulations on Commonwealth Gold. Thank you. Thanks so much. Cheers. Isn't that a brilliant story? Leighton Levy, the organizers of the Commonwealth Games have outdone themselves. They've said to the para-athletes, well, you won't be occupying a small space on the plate. You're going to have an equal share of the plate. Able-bodied para-athletes, no distinction, no delineation, no segregation, all together now, perform for the benefit of the fans. It's beautiful. Absolutely, George. Inclusivity has always been a part of what makes mankind so great. I mean, we live in a world where we're segregated in so, on so many different levels, social, economic, race, ethnicity generally. But when you see what is possible when we get everybody on, on a similar platform, it's more than just equity. It's giving opportunity and it's giving an example for the rest of the world to see what can happen when people are given a fair chance to be their best selves. Absolutely so. Anil, it's a tremendous story, a tremendous feat that the Commonwealth Games Federation has pulled off. Even amid all the things we spoke about on opening day, this is one aspect of the Games that you have to applaud those who put this together for, for making happen. Fantastic. And you must talk about the organizers. But what has impressed me even more? Let me tell you something. Let me big up Sportsmax and Ricardo Chambers. Because many times you think that interviews are just interviews, just for marketing, just to get some sponsors, uh, logos on the TV. But the kind of in-depth questions and understanding that is coming out of Sportsmax and Ricardo Chambers to bring information, it is impressive on an international scale. I watch everything, anything, ESPN, BBC, whatever. And those questions that I've seen, whether it's to Dylan Carter or Higgs or to Hodge, they are absolutely brilliant. And it brings forth knowledge, information that we can analyze and move forward. So, Ricardo Chambers, big up yourself, man. There you go. I Nothing else that. to say. He seconds that as well. All right. And I third that. All right. Let's take the break and come right back. Come on out tonight. Continues after the.
Yeah, many people said that Barbados would have been overmatched in the T20 cricket competition at the Commonwealth Games. Of course, women's cricket making its debut in games history here at this Birmingham extravaganza. The men have had their go around already, 1998 at the Commonwealth Games in Kuala Lumpur. But because it's only Barbados, a segment of what the West Indies collectively represents, people said, well, if the wind is struggle against these established powers in women's cricket and in cricket, some of the biggest marketing names in cricket, then Barbados will also struggle. Well, that syllogism proving to be faulty because the Bayesians put on a performance that was good enough to beat Pakistan earlier today. The scores in the game, Barbados won 44 for four of their 20 overs. Uh, Haley Matthews, the captain, 51 of 50 balls, four fours and one six. Uh, Kaisia Knight, not out, 62 of 58 balls, nine fours and a strike rate of 110.70 for the wicketkeeper batter. And uh, that's how they got the 144 runs of those 20 overs. In reply, Pakistan were restricted to 129 of their 20 overs and uh, the Pakistan going team going down by 15 runs. So an upset to start the T20 cricket program and Barbados gentlemen were full value for that victory. I'll start with you, Lane. Yeah, absolutely, George. When you consider that about half the starting 11 for the West Indies women's team play for Barbados, you know, Kaisi at night, uh, DeAndre Dutton, of course, the team captain, Haley Matthews. You look, and of course, Selman as well, Shakira Selman. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the core of the West Indies women's success, the teams, the, te the players that bring success to that team. And the way they played today is an example of what happens when you bring consistency to performances. Because Kaisia Knight has, for the last year, been among the leading run scorers for the West, women, West Indies women's team. And she brought it again, 62 not out. The captain led from the front, 51, and of course, taking one for 13. When she, when she took the ball. And it just shows you, when you bring your air game, you can beat anybody with your air game. And that's what the Barbados team did today. Very proud of them. Yeah, up, the apple cart upset early in this T20 cricket competition. And then... Early. And what they should do is take the management and the administration of Barbados cricket and put them in charge of netballing Barbados <laughs> and Trinidad and Tobago. Because... For Barbados to put together from a small island, to move like such a unit, to play such pristine cricket. Yes, it's one game, but it's one game that they've been preparing for to get started. There were intelligence. While Leighton says the core of the West Indies team, yes, five players, but they played better more managed, more together, more intelligent than the West Indies team. Maybe we should have had Barbados play in Taruba Stadium against India. We may have seen a better performance. But this Barbados team is showing class. To hold on to Pakistan with a population of, of millions and millions of people, a team that always plays highest level, plays in World Cup, and to be a small island, to go out there and put it on them was tremendous. Well done to the Barbadian woman well done to the coach to the management well done Proud. yeah but, but before we talk about another syllogism uh Leighton Levy <laughs> the critical thing is partnerships and look when you say partnerships are the backbone of any of, of run scoring in cricket mm. cricket you're, you're you're making a, an argument about the biggest truism in the history of cricket yeah that, that's that's a fact you don't need to be a genius or even an idiot to be able to accept that but Barbados nine for one early, mm -hmm. dotting back on the bench, and then came a hundred and seven run partnership between Knight and Haley Matthews. Totally unflustered, totally unhurried, deliberate, and accumulated, accumulated bad balls dispatched, but they batted sensibly. That was the basis of this one forty four. Yeah, and of course I put that down to the leadership of Haley Matthews. When you look at what she's been able to do for the West Indies, and now she's transferred it on to the Barbados team. When she was appointed captain of the, the, the West Indies team earlier this year, you kind of sense that this was an opportunity for her to bring leadership to the respective teams that she leads. And you saw that again today. She was calm. She kept Kaisia Knight calm. They rotated the strike. They played smart cricket. And that's down to her leadership. So, yes, the, 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 the partnership was crucial. But the, the, the key element behind that partnership was the leadership that Matthews has brought to this team and she will bring to the West Indies as well. And on the point of the West Indies, and you have many people now who are going to make the link and say, wait, Pakistan against the West Indies. Hmm. Barbados beating up Pakistan today. 
So what does that say about Bar uh, Barbados vis-a-vis -vis the West Indies? Notwithstanding the fact that the Barbados team has several prominent members of what would be a West Indies strongest You team. have to realize, when you go from a national structure into the West Indies structure, there are differences in management, respect, coaches, trainers, uh, chemistry. ability, chemistry, ability to understand. And when you are Cricket West Indies, who has been floundering for the last 30 years, you can understand that the, Bar the Barbados team and the management are together. They have the team together. They're on one plan. I've never heard... In the last 20 years, descriptions that you and Leighton just made, intelligence, patience, we, we see in the men's game or the West Indies women's game. You hit a boundary, you're ahead of the score rate, and yet you out whooping again, trying to go. It's just not intelligent. This Barbados team, the women played intelligently. They lost their talisman. They lost Dutton early, and they were not rattled. They hit a boundary, then they moved the ball around. Pakistan bring on the mystery spinner. They absorb pressure. Mm. They play, and they take the runs and keep the, the, the strike turning over it was brilliant intelligent well managed well coached well executed that's my caribbean people yeah and, and Leighton, this sets up the barbadians very well for the rest of the competition and of course it puts pressure on pakistan because of course only two teams mm. will emerge from this pool and they could have asked for a better start yes a win any win is is welcome but the girls, the ladies, would have taken tremendous confidence from the manner of that victory. It wasn't any backs against the wall, lucky chance in your arm, trying to manufacture a wicket because the pressure was growing and the batting team was chasing down your runs. Thoroughly professional. That will give this team an extra boost. Absolutely. And of course, the, the belief in that team is already bolstered by the fact that, as I mentioned, Haley Matthews, of course, Deandre Dratton is to, yet to fire. She's, she's a game winner by herself. So, given what they, they, they managed to pull off today, going into the next match, I think it's against Australia, isn't it? Who knows what's going to be possible? Because the Australians will be noticing this. And if you notice today, the Australians against India were had their backs against the wall. So, there is a balance there, I think, that will that could be gone for the West Indies way. The Barbados way, sorry, not the West Indies. It happened to me today. Yeah, that, it happened to me today. Yeah. <laughs> Where the, 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 the confidence going into this match, the players will have more belief. Kaisa Knight, I think, is going to be crucial. But of course, again, it comes down to the leadership of Haley Matthews. And I think it's possible that Australia could actually end up being on the losing end against this Barbados team. And so here's this thing now, uh, uh, Anil, the last one on this uh, women's cricket issue. We hinted at it yesterday. The home nation, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales... They have multiple teams competing in multiple events. You raise the question, well, why is it that the West Indies, one of the biggest names in world cricket, because notwithstanding the fact that we've been subpar for decades now, the West Indies is still bona fide one of the best marketing names in cricket, one of the best histories. How come only one? And many people say, well, the strength in depth isn't there. Barbados is quality, but the Jamaicas, the Trinidad and Tobago's, Guyanas of the world would prove that maybe the organizers ought to have been far more accommodating to more than one team from a place like the West Indies. This is not Kenya or Zimbabwe, no disrespect to them, but those don't have the histories that the West Indies have in both genders where cricket is concerned. Barbados, you would argue, shouldn't be the only team from the West Indies campaigning in this T20 cricket competition. Absolutely. Minimum three three teams. Trinidad and Tobago has been one of the best regional teams, mm -hmm. women and men, coming out of a good structure, good coaching, good youth programs, and so on. Jamaica also. So, and then you have Guyana. But a minimum three teams because look at what Barbados has just done. They've just beaten one of the test-playing nations, one with the richest history in, in cricket, men and women. And they beat them soundly. So you must be able to immediately make a case for the next uh, Commonwealth Games that we get two or three more spots. Maybe cricket needs a Jack Warner in it to make sure we get spots like what he did for football. And, and more crucially as well, George, is the, is the impetus is to grow the women's sport. You should be including more teams to give other players opportunities because as, as Anne rightly said, Trinidad is a very good team. So does Jamaica because the Jamaica actually won the last competition um, on, on goal difference over Barbados. So 
why not give them the opportunity? Well, I guess I tell you what, the next meeting of the Commonwealth Games Federation, when they're talking about the next event, regardless of what happens in the women's cricket from here, the argument would have already been made the case. The West Indies, the West Indies or not to have only one team eligible to play in a Commonwealth Games women's cricket tournament. It, 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 it really is it, it, slackness. Yeah? They got away with it this time. Next time, don't repeat, that. don't repeat that mistake. Don't make that mistake happen again. You'd be pleased to know that we're taking a break right now. But when we come back, table tennis, Guyana, Guyana, Guyana's women, oh, they were very good today. Yep. Back with us on Commonwealth tonight as we review the performances of Caribbean athletes on the second and full day of action at the Commonwealth Games taking place in Birmingham, England. The Caribbean already on the medal table courtesy of that Iron Woman from Bermuda, Dame Flora Duffy, besting rivals in the triathlon. And the Caribbean can be proud of what the Bermudan has achieved for herself and for this region at these games. Table tennis is what we're talking about now. And before we talk about results on the program earlier today, let's have a little look at Guyana's gym, Guyana's best woman table tennis player, Chelsea Edgehill. Chelsea Edgehill, you are 17 years old when you competed at the Commonwealth Games for the first time. This is your second time at the Commonwealth Games. What has the journey been like over the last nine years? Uh, it's been a, a, a long one, but it's been a fun one. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of um, sacrificing, a lot of you know endurance, a lot of focus. And to be here nine years later in better shape than I was at 17 is an amazing feeling. How would you say you have grown in that period, or how much have you grown in that period? I've grown tremendously since uh, since I was 17. I've um, achieved things that I never thought that was possible, and um, to be here now in probably the best shape I've been in in my entire career, it's a, it's a good it's a good thing. The Olympic Games in Tokyo last year was special. You performed really well. How have the expectations changed coming into the Commonwealth Games, given the growth that you've had, especially over the last 12 months? Um, the, for sure, the, the expectations have definitely changed. Um, it's now moving from, you know, give it your best, and now there's the expectation of great performances and, you know, to an, to an extent, medals. So, um, like I guess I said before, you know, it's a good feeling with the expectations changing, uh, but at the same time, it's still a lot to, you know, have to stay focused for more. Yeah. Does it add pressure in any way? A little bit. Um, but, you know, my coaches and, you know, my team, they've, you know, been adamant that I stay focused on what it is I want to achieve at the Games and let all the other things fall into place. How do you do that? How do you maintain that focus um, in a space where the expectations are clearly there um, of yourself but also of a nation? Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of mental training and... You know, just you, rem you know, you have the people around you reminding you of what's important, and uh, at this time, what's important is to play well, and everything else will fall into place. If I play well enough, I'll get the results everyone wants, and if not, I hope I play well enough that I'm satisfied with my performance. Of course, a lot of table tennis to play at these Commonwealth Games. When it's all over, women's singles, women's doubles, team event, what would success look like for Chelsea Edgehill? I think success ultimately would look like a medal. You know, um, it's everyone's dream, it's everyone's goal, but it's a personal goal of mine to have a medal at these games. I've worked very hard, and I think, you know, um, it would be nice to get a medal, but if not, success would mean that I've played everything that I've had and I left it on the table, and, you know, that person had a better day. That's all that would mean. Svelte, graceful, fiercely competitive, highly intelligent, Chelsea Edgehill, Guyana's first representative in table tennis at the Olympics. And yeah, she won her preliminary round match. Then she lost in the first round, but she advertised her well-being significantly with that performance in Tokyo. And now she is in Birmingham 
and she has a mission to win a medal. She's not there to make up the numbers, not there for the experience, not there for a day out in Birmingham. She's there about the serious business. Gentlemen, this young woman is fascinating. She has, well, born in the USA. She has a degree in chemistry. chemistry. She learned her table tennis in Guyana, even though she was born in New York. And uh, she has something about her that gives you the impression that with the right breaks that you would need in sports, she could be one of the very, very best from the region to hold that paddle stick in hand. Well, let me just say another great interview. And when you see, let me add some adjectives to the description. Calm, brilliant, confident, amazing, bold. This young lady, she's telling you, we're here for medals. We didn't come here to play pressure, either bus pipe or make diamonds. You have to teach your athletes. We're not in this going through all of this torture to just succumb to the pressure and cry and say, well, oh, everybody expects me to win. Oh, my goodness, let me go in a corner and cry. You have to lift your game. When they turn up the pressure, you have to show up. You have to love the pressure. And that comes, as she said, from mental training. So I must say, whoever is a coach, whoever is a management, to her parents, they've done an exceptional job because you cannot only work the physiological aspects, the technical aspects of the game. You have have to train the mind as well as the body so spending six hours in the gym or on the uh, on the table or in the or uh, running and you spend no time developing the mind dealing with pressure you're going to crumble you have to train both of them simultaneously later yeah, absolutely and of course one of the things that impresses me about her is that she's a trailblazer as you mentioned george first guy needs to play in the olympics and she has taken on that responsibility not with fear, not with any intimidation or trepidation, but she's taking it on wholefully and looking forward to even, you know, blazing greater trails for others from Guyana and the Caribbean to see, you know, examples of what is possible. We mentioned before about glass ceilings. She's kicking in the door in a big, big way in the Caribbean when it comes to table tennis because there have been great players from the Caribbean and with table tennis, um, you know, from here in Jamaica, in Guyana, in Trinidad, and Tobago. But... What she's doing for her country, it goes beyond anything that you can possibly articulate because she's not just blazing a trail, she's busting the doors down as well. And it's nice to see how calm she is under that expectation, under that pressure. And it tells you that, as you mentioned, there's something special about her and it will manifest itself in, in due time. Yeah, and, and, and when you look at the results here, uh, Anil, I just refreshed them a while ago. The Guyanese women with Chelsea Edgehill in, in the team, they beat Fiji, opened up three love, mm. of course, best of five, so three nil. Uh, three love is a win. And then South Africa took them to the brink, but they proved stronger. Three, two mm. in the end. So two solid performances and under what, their belt. And what she said there, which is key, she said she's fitter now than she ever you know was. What? To all our players who play tennis, uh, golf, uh, racket sports, who forget that it's a physical sport that you've got to do your cross training. You've got to do in the, go in the gym. I remember seeing a young guy called Shane Stone playing at 10, 11, 12 years old in Tobago in Mount Irving. And when I got to interview him 15 years after, after he was the national tennis champion, I asked him, you know, how much cross training, how much, what you do in the gym, how much stairs you run if you're going to the stadium. He said, never lifted a weight. And then I realized that as coaches, we are clueless. If you're not fast enough, you're not fit enough, you're not uh, agile enough, you're not uh, um, able to move your feet, you will never beat the world's best. So she is fitter now. She said it twice or three times in a two-minute interview. She's ready for them to take a medal. And one of the key things, you know, to follow up on what Angel just said, when you're fit, your brain stays with you longer because... When you when your physical start physicality starts to break down, your brain goes with it, and then you your mistakes come, and then you lose matches. That's why head my others get out so fast. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the fact is though that today was apart apart from the apart from Guyana's women, it was not happy hunting for the Caribbean in the table tennis. The men uh, struggled uh, from from the, the the various teams: Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, Guyana also uh, struggled. Uh, England easily took care of Guyana in their opening uh, contest. 
and the, 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 the thing for me, and I, I don't want to use the words disappointment. I mean, Anil Roberts is here as, well, he's not agent provocateur because that would suggest that we've given him a role to play. He's mm. just being his normal self. And that's why we have him here. But the fact is, I don't want to say disappointment or say underwhelming, although you have to call the performances for what they are. And if I'm honest, looking at Guyana against the, uh, the, the, the English team, I thought to myself, hmm, they look a bit overmatched. And that's okay. That's okay. That, that can happen. But I, I don't think the Guyanese boys will look back and believe that they really did themselves justice in this um, a contest where they were comfortably held by England. Yes. Well, I will use the word disappointing because when there you play certain sports that you have a track record on, well, like Leighton said, back in the day with Nigel Christopher and, and Louis and... Trinidad and Tobago had Janelyn Branca and so on. Jamaica had great players. We played in the CAC. This is in the late 70s, early 1980s. We are in 2022 and we've gone backwards. Why? Is it administration? Is it facilities? Is it competition? Is it that parents are now letting the players play less time and there's more time on the iPad and the video games? What is it? You have to analyze it. But you can't tell me in a game that is the same... Uh, parameters on a table all you need is a table a racket and a ball that you have not progressed to the level to compete with the world i went to the world championship in shanghai china and while i'm in between coaching george in the hotel there's a club and there are 20 tables and little four-year-olds they put the table down short and four-year-olds hitting forward loop spinning going on about 50 of them in one hotel yeah. club but, but but here's the thing though uh, leighton we talk about great Caribbean table tennis players and the prodigious uh, Yvonne Foster from mm -hmm. Jamaica and uh, Dexter St. Louis uh, from Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, Ma Michael Hyatt God from Jamaica. Jamaica. Well, here's yeah. the thing, here's the thing. Rian Chung. Yeah. The, 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 the reason Anil rightly complains about why is it that the Caribbean was able to churn out players of this standard over the years. Those players, I would argue, emerged because of serendipity. It was no system that created uh -huh. them. They just emerged. And the reason we're not seeing players of that caliber now is because there is no system to keep on churning out players of the standards. When we play against England and the other countries, who the funding for table tennis, it's not, it's not crumbs that the Table Tennis Federation gets in the, in the UK. It's directed and dedicated lottery funding that they get the share of that they need to keep producing World Cup players. Andy Roberts knows that table tennis and in the in the English speaking Caribbean, it's cap in hand. Hey, can you put mm. something but here? Andy Roberts do this, also do this? knows yes. my good brother. Yes. That I went into a sport that requires expensive uh, 50 meter pool and yes. flume and so on. I coached Leah Martindale, the first black woman to ever make an Olympic final. You know where I coach her? Where you go in Trinidad to Lyme when all them girls find you nice, TGI Friday. <laughs> that used to be called the Queen's Park Hotel. It was a three-lane, 20-yard pool to practice dives. I took a flower pot from the side, turn it upside down. Leah was on top of it and I'm bracing like that. She went to the 1996 Olympics and beat the world and came fifth in the Olympics. So you can make excuses and you can cry it, it, about but everything. But it, it, but it's not an excuse. You've got though. to work but and do on, it. But hold on, hold it on. It was done before with no money. Yes. We have the talent. We should have the coaches. You but, have but, the table tennis board. But do I'm it. saying, but, but fine, but I'm saying you have to concede. In mass participation sports, track and field gets the funding. We're brilliant at it, the Caribbean is. Collectively. Well, Jamaica track and, especially. No, yeah. track and, Grenada has the world champion in the javelin. Yes. No, don't, don't say yes. yes. Don't say yes. Well, Trinidad and Tobago is not yes. doing so good now. T.T. and the other man in the 200 final. Jamaica Jamaica The point I'm making is that those sports get that kind of funding and support. I'm saying what you did was remarkable, and that's why you'll be fetid for that until the day you die and after. But Leighton, it can't be denied. Sports such as those, because of the gap in support, you'll have occasions where brilliant athletes meet brilliant coaches and excellence happens. But in the main, we're going to have more misses than hits. Absolutely. And, and, but there are other reasons for it as well, ah. George. Because one of the things, one of the key things about it as well is that we live in an age you now where people gravitate towards what they seem to be the popular sports. Yes. Right? So the, the, those two sports like table tennis lose talent because there, there might be a kid out there who's 
maybe the next grade. Yeah, but goes to play football. But wants to, to go do football track. or go to track yeah. or, or basketball. Yeah. So one of the things that needs to happen, though, is that kids need to be exposed to some of these things a lot earlier in life. Yes. And give them an opportunity to feel what they, you know, can you, when you start playing a sport for the first time, you know this is for you. Yeah. And keep them in there by, by a proper systems, which is co- complementing what you said. Yeah. About finding the talent and having it stay within the system and develop within the system. We have to move on. We have to move on. I to know, but you're hitting yeah. the nail on the head yes. quickly. But right now in the Caribbean, sometimes we don't let the best coaches deal with the best athletes because yes. of politics yes. of administrators True. who are myopic and nepotistic. Absolutely so. And that is why Sportsmax is giving the children from the Caribbean the chance to see Chelsea, Edge Hill, and Guyana. They kicked butt today. They have some big games tomorrow. They are live and they are a force to be reckoned with. We hope that the performance of the Guyanese women can inspire the next wave of children who say, Mom, Dad, I want to be the next table tennis star. All right, let's talk about some rugby now because the Rugby Sevens, uh, Jamaica, uh, made its debut at the Commonwealth Games in rugby and... I, I, I am fearing passing the chalice to <laughs> Alan Roberts because I don't know what he will do. It was 62 uh, love in the first game, 45 in the second. The Australians putting 62 unanswered. Remember, rugby sevens, seven players, seven minutes, and uh, it was yeah, they were mugged. a bloodbath yeah. for the Jamaicans. But... All is not lost, and I know I am the high priest of optimism. I accept that role <laughs> on the show. While Anil fights with himself late, now I'll come to you for a first perspective to say that the first time at this level, you know, people who are not used to altitude who go there for the first time, the nose bleeds, you can't sleep, the parched throats, the thirst, and everything. So it is to be expected that the baptism for the Jamaicans would have been bloody. And Leighton, it was bloody. It was bloody. And, and, and there's good reason for that. Jamaica's rugby has gone through several rebirths over the last couple of decades. And I think what we're seeing here now is a team in the embryonic stage of another rebirth. And I think in time, they would be better. But as you said, it was a bloodbath today. Beautiful, beautiful. You, Elisa, <laughs> you, you and George, kumbaya. I just feel to sit down and do yoga. Let me tell you something. This is Commonwealth Games, live on TV, live on Sportsmax. Sevens rugby is not 15s rugby. 15s rugby requires generational change, coaching, science, technical ability, and so on. Jamaica is known as the island that produces the fastest of the fast, the greatest island in the world per capita for speed. Sevens rugby is just about pure speed. You can't tell me that Kenya, known for steeplechase and 5,000 meters, have men out sprinting Jamaican left, right, and center, or they have no shame. I'm very sorry. I, I was upset in the Winter Olympics with a man coming down a hill at a snail's pace with like a crop stick but this jamaican what the uniform look good let me be positive <laughs> the uniform the jamaican uniform look good but other than that let me tell you something it's better you stay home and eat jamaican patty than to go and do your flag that at the start they never even lasted about 15 seconds where they thought well forget australia they're great right but kenya you would say okay let's check the fixtures okay forget australia all right kenya Rugby, not so historical and so on. We could battle them. Kenya embarrassed us. I'm very sorry. If you all did not know that that team was that bad and you went to England and George, England had no altitude. Birmingham is flat on the sea. It's a port city. It had no altitude for nose to bleed. It's pure licks. And I'm very sorry. Aki normal, let them come home. Listen, listen, let me defend my nose bleed defend, analogy. Defend. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that in the same way that people react when they go to altitude, the point I'm making is the level of competition was like altitude for the Jamaican rugby players. And you hear Anil talk this and talk that, and like Shakespeare wrote, full of sound and fury, but I won't see you signify nothing because you signify a lot of some things. The point to be made is this it's the levels, it's all about levels. Mm. Check the number of Rugby Sevens games that Kenya would have played at this level. It was obvious in the performance. Mm. Australians need no recommendation. Yeah, they're, they're one of the great rugby playing teams. And I'm just saying, Leighton, 
Everything starts somewhere. Yeah, but then I, stay I, home. I, I, <laughs> no, don't make no excuses. No, no, everything starts it came back to, again, It goes back to the previous conversation we had about funding and support also. And I, I, I think that rugby is one of those sports. I mean, just like rugby league in Jamaica, they struggle to get funding. They struggle yes. to get this kind of resources that they need to be able to be consistent and, and get the kind of proper You training. know what I love about you? Some of your greatest Jamaican sprinters come from the poorest of homes. Mm, they don't have nothing. So don't tell me about money. I'm talking about pure speed. Look at that field. No, 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 no. Seven... Hold on, Anil. Hold on, Anil. Hold on, Anil. Hold on, Anil. But yeah, please tell me. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> the same poor Jamaicans uh -huh. who excel in track and field go into a high school yes. with a track and field program. Right. Hold on. Hold Correct. on. Hold on. With... A highly skilled coach who would have Correct. learned his or her craft yes. at the GC Foster College of Sport Fantastic. and Physical Education. So what Leighton is saying and what I'm agreeing with and, mm -hmm. and associating myself with, yes. the youngster, first of all, no youngster goes into a high school wanting to play, play rugby. rugby. Pause. Hold on. No, hold I hear on, you. Hold on, hold on, hold on, they're going to say a break. I, 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 no, no, I, no, no, no. I, I control the break. <laughs> yes, so I'm saying, right. to you, I'm saying to you, no youngster goes into a yes. Jamaican school wanting to play Correct. rugby. Correct. That's one. And then... Even when rugby is waved in front of them as an option, yes. there's no program akin to track and field okay. or program akin to anything for Listen them to, to go me into. Now so carefully. that's a disadvantage. Listen to me the carefully is now. Your witness. You have such a wealth of talent at all your co your colleges. Everybody can win. The top four, the top five, they move on in track and field. I, as a rugby coach, I go to number six, seven, and eight. I say, gentlemen, look at this little oblong ball. Come and let's see. It's a sevens. Let's see what we can do. And take out 50 young, fast boys, one or two strong ones, and teach them the game. Sevens rugby is easy to accelerate up the world ranks. Fifteens, no, no, you, that take a whole investment, mm. coaching, strategy, plan. But you have to start somewhere. If you want to go Commonwealth Games, you have to do that. You can't just say, eh, eh. We have Commonwealth Games. Come the bar. You come out the bar. You come out the restaurant. Put but, on a light uniform. But Anil, no Anil, man. Anil, it's it's it's. It, let me say. Let me say. This. Now don't get me wrong. No. I'm not as angry no, with them as the net netball. Or, 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 or Alpine skier at the Olympics correct, last time. Correct. But here's the thing, Anil. Here's the thing, Leighton. If it is that this were the uh, this was the second or third Commonwealth Games. Mm. And Jamaica's rugby sevens were getting blown out like this. I would be tempted to join Anil. Mm. I cannot associate myself with his okay. pessimism because Anil is the first. It's the virgin birth. Okay. It's well, the first I put it to you. Put the camera here. <laughs> and I want you all to record this, please. I want you to record this wherever. Mr. God Director, willing, give him his shot. That we are in eight years, in 2030. I want you all to record that. Because I see that same thing happening in 2030, and I want George to eat his words. All right, here's the thing. We both will be around in 20 years' time, yeah? In 10 years' time. I'm saying that will not happen. And Jamaica will not be the only Caribbean team at the Rugby Sevens at the Commonwealth Games. Okay. Anil's country, TNT, will also be represented. Well, I hope we do better than that. Because, <laughs> because obviously, for Jamaica to reach it, mean you beat me. So, and all what I'm saying now also goes for my team. All right. We preview day two of the Commonwealth <laughs> Games <laughs> when we return. <laughs> Back with us on Commonwealth tonight. Did I say day two? It's actually day three. Day one was yesterday, Thursday. Day two is today, Friday. Day three is going to be on Saturday. So what are the events that we want you to look forward to? Before we go into that, just look at the medal table going into the third day. The Aussies out front. New Zealand, uh, England, Canada, Scotland round out the top five. Bermuda are, well, Bermuda is there by virtue of Dame Flora Duffy winning at the triathlon and Wales, Cyprus, and Northern Ireland. So what? All four home nations are in the top nine. So 2 a.m. athletics, uh, the marathon will be contested. Rugby sevens, Uganda versus Jamaica at 4 a.m. Annie Roberts will be asleep at that time. Swimming, the heats of some of these swimming events from 4.50 a.m. 
Uh, this is Jamaica time. Uh, 6 a.m. Athletics, the marathon again. And then by 8 a.m., boxing uh, will be on uh, the tab. 10 a.m., cycling finals. Uh, interest should be keen there from the Caribbean perspective. Midday, netball, Jamaica versus South Africa. Swimming finals from 1.30 p.m. And you can return 6.30 p.m. Jamaica time, 7.30 p.m. outside Jamaica for the Commonwealth Tonight show. So, gentlemen, let's talk about the netball first before we go into the swimming because we have a clutch of Caribbean swimmers who should be in the pool on the third day. Anil Roberts, our resident expert, has narrowed the list down to those he believes have legitimate shots of going far in their respective events. We're going to talk about those in a short while. But Jamaica and South Africa, two quality teams. The South Africans have been, if we say that the Jamaicans have been chasing the shadows that, that, that are Australia, New Zealand, well, Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand yeah. yeah, those two shadows Jamaica have been chasing. South Africa is the one chasing the shadows that are Jamaica, New Zealand, Australia, and, and England. England. Yeah, so what about that clash tomorrow between themselves it's and the Sunshine? I think it's going to be an intense game. I think over the last few years we've seen in the World Cup, the South Africa has pushed the Jamaicans to the very limit. Um, I think, though, that Jamaica still has too much talent. I think Johnny Lafola has proven, as we've seen in the last four years in the, in the Suncorp Super League, she's the best scorer, the best shooter. I don't think South Africans can stop her. However, if Jamaica is not careful, South Africa could probably pull the rug from under their feet tomorrow. Mm. You know, there are certain games in a tournament structure. When you, you see, if you go to the World Cup, you've got to play seven games within one month in football, 90 minutes. In netball, there are key moments that could determine or propel you into medal contention. If Jamaica is to go at New Zealand or Australia for that gold medal or silver medal, this game will either make or break them. I say that because... This will be an acid test of the chemistry and how quickly Jamaica can pull themselves together because they're all great players. What they're trying to do now as they, they mold together and they eat together, travel in the bus, is create that camaraderie and chemistry and feel that you sense when a player is moving here. When you shoot, you know when it's going to miss. You jump and get the rebounds, you intercept. That's what's going to happen. South Africa is the test. If Jamaica can come out, and give South Africa a good walloping by about 22 goals and put together seamless transitions, get the substitutions in gear and look solid, it will set up a possible gold medal run for the Team Jamaica where we could all sit down and say, hey, it's about time. One thing we didn't tell the viewers about that Jamaica performance, Leighton, was that Connie Francis, the head coach, had the luxury of giving Janiel Fowler the second half off. Mm -hmm. So it was Shimona Nelson who was torching the Welsh defence. She was perfect, 29 from 29. Fowler was 32 from 33. And the fact is, she will tell you that, look, the Wales game was ideal because it allowed me to test composite parts, mm -hmm. yeah? And to give Shimona Nelson one half of netball in the opening game of a Commonwealth Games medal quest puts the team in good stead and shows how strong we are. We didn't have to have our ace in the hole out there for the whole game. True, and, and she, it was a, you know, a good opportunity for her to rest for, for games like what's coming up tomorrow. So I think, you know, Shimon Nelson obviously, of course, also plays in the Sun Court Super Yeah, League. Collingwood, my price. Yeah, and, and does a very good job for them. I think she's their leading scorer this year. And also in, in offensive rebounds as well. So it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing for Jamaica to have that kind of depth. But I think the keys to the game is going to be how clean Jamaica played tomorrow. Not the turnovers, and the unforced turnovers, that is. And of course, because the shooting talent is there. I mean, Jamaica can outshoot any team in the world. The key thing is to prevent South Africa from getting on any kind of run in any of the quarters tomorrow. And I think victory will be um, assured. You see, George, where that comes from, what Leighton is talking about, is quality competition. Yeah. And in the Caribbean, our Caribbean yeah. competition, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, yeah. St. Vincent, has dropped. Don't forget that because we're going to expand on that. We're going to have time during the coverage of these Commonwealth Games to talk about that point that I flagged, well, that I, I flew that kite earlier to say that Adam Roberts will be expanding on his theory about the quality of the region's netball and how it can be enhanced, it can be improved. Let's talk about swimming, Anil, because as I noted, a clutch of Caribbean athletes will be in the pool on the third day. 
but you've said based on your analysis and your knowledge of this thing that there are a few of them with better prospects than most Yes, now first of all, all of them going, and it's good to see the Caribbean, especially some young athletes, getting out there. The Commonwealth Games is a good stepping stone. The Commonwealth Games, Pan American Games, moving on up into the World Championships and the Olympics. But tomorrow, we can look for Sherelle Thompson from Trinidad and Tobago in the 50 meter freestyle. If she gets anywhere near her best time of in, in the low 25s, she should make it to the semi final. Also, Isaac Bastian in the 100 meter breaststroke. He's a sort of a maverick, you know. He puts in the work, but sometimes he may miss his taper because whether in, in, tapering is an individual art. It's not science. Each athlete requires a different amount of a rest and at different competitions with the number of events they're going to swim. Even that individual athlete never rests the same amount. If he gets his taper right, he's flawless in his technique, a nice tall athlete, brilliant breaststroker. I'm looking for him to get into the semi-final. And there's also a young Jamaican, I think it's Mackenzie Headley. If she gets down to her times that I've seen her capable of doing, she could get a second swim. There you go. Alayton, you pretty much agree with that? Those pretty three much, to yeah. look at? Pretty much. Bastian, Headley, and Thompson in the pool. Anil says you should keep an eye on them. All right. The well, table tennis will be on as well. We told you about Guyana and the two uh, teams that they conquered on opening day, South Africa and Fiji in the women's event. The men, uh, they started with losses. This is what the schedule looks like for table tennis. 3.30 Group 2, India against Guyana uh, in the women's. And then St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they lost. Uh, they, they're, they're coming off a losing opening day. They uh, battle Singapore. And then by 6 a.m., Guyana will battle Fiji in the men's play. And then Singapore will meet Barbados. Before we go, I want to tell the viewers that the action in the at the Commonwealth Games, it is easy to follow the action. And what do I mean by that? Right now, I'm going on to the Sportsmax app. And as I told you, the Sportsmax Plus, when you go to the Sportsmax app, you go to Sportsmax Plus, there's action going on. Right now, there's badminton on Sportsmax Plus. When I go to the Commonwealth Games Channel 1, there is lawn bowls going on on Commonwealth Games Channel 1. Then when I go to CG Channel 2, there is, well, they're getting ready for table tennis action right there. Then when I go to 3, when I go to 3, there's cycling on. When I go to 4, there is 400 meters freestyle men's pool swimming action. When I go to 5, there is action in badminton as well. This is the same action from Sportsmax Plus. Then when I go to 6, yeah? When I go to 6, I'm seeing Australia and Scotland in 3-on-3 three -three basketball. Do you want more than George. that? This is that. This is the Sportsmax app. This George, is what it looks like. I've gone to 1. The bowls, the lawn bowls. Lawn bowls. It's exciting. <laughs> so, so, so this is what it is. This is what it is. So Sportsmax Plus, Sportsmax Plus viewers, and six other channels. So seven portals for you to be able to enjoy whatever you want to watch on the Commonwealth Games schedule. You can't ask for it better than this. And then when all that is said and done, for things that you follow on this slide, you're doing other things because you know your day is busy. You can come to Commonwealth tonight for the analysis featuring Leighton and Anil and Obadele Thompson is set to join us as well to talk about the events. We put them in perspective for you and then you can hear Anil rant about these performances that <laughs> fall below his very, very high threshold for acceptability. All right, that's all the time we have here on Commonwealth Tonight. I want to thank Anil, I want to thank Leighton. You'll be seeing a lot more of these gentlemen over the course of our coverage of the games from now until August 8th. We'll be right here the Sportsmax app people, tell your friends. You have multiple devices at home. Put them to use. You can be watching Sportsmax and the Commonwealth Games on six different devices, six different events. Yeah, get to it now. Download the Sportsmax app from the Google Play Store or the App Store. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>